Week one of the NFL season officially in the books. Welcome to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. I'm Craig Mish along with Davis Baddock. We're coming off Monday Night Football. We'll get to that in a second. Also, Mike Trout chasing history for those of you who have just been football focused. Huge game coming for him tonight, too. We'll get to that as well. Uh, but Davis, great to be back with you here today. We'll do some waiver wire. We'll talk about some injuries, no doubt. But obviously, uh, a hot topic of discussion last night's ending of the game between Seattle and Denver really, honestly, you know, should be more of a discussion what happened throughout the game where the Broncos just did not really show up uh, to play that game in Seattle. But naturally, everyone is talking about the end of the game, which I'm sure we'll focus on quite a bit here, too. Yeah, I mean, throughout the entire game, bringing the play clock all the way down to like double zeros every time, targeting the, you know, backup tight ends. It was uh, 14 targets for the wide receivers, Sutton, Judy, Hamler, 12 targets for Albert O., Eric Tomlinson and Andrew Beck, 12 targets for Javante Williams, uh, you know, multiple fumbles on the goal line. But I, this is, I, I think that um, that decision to kick the 64 yard field goal, instead of attempting to gain five yards, I, I was trying to think of some of the dumbest things I've ever seen happen on a football field. I, I remember the Colts Sunday night football punt. Remember the dumb swinging gate, style thing uh that that came to mind in terms of like all time dumb things i've seen but trading multiple first round picks giving 200 million dollars guaranteed to a quarterback and then not trusting him to gain five yards in the first game of the season has to be one of the stupidest things i've ever seen happen on a football field yeah very very bizarre and very reminiscent davis of last year's denver broncos and i've talked about this last year they slow the game down. They run the clock down to zero. They did it with Drew Locke. They did it with uh, Simeon and all the other quarterbacks they have. And now you're doing it with Russell Wilson in the NFL. <laughs> sort of bizarre. And on top of it, McManus had never kicked a field goal that long or even had come close in the course of his career, let alone not in Denver. Very bizarre, to say the least, for sure. Let's get to our headlines here on the show. As Seattle not only covers that spread last night, Monday night home dogs, you just have to close your eyes and take the dog and they cover again. It was an underdog week across the board in the NFL. Seattle wins. Russell Wilson loses. Mike Trout hit his hit seventh consecutive game with a home run. Unbelievable, Davis. He's got one more tonight to tie the record set by Dale Long, Don Mattingly, and of course, Ken Griffey Jr. Will he do it tonight? Elijah Mitchell's going to miss a couple of months with an MCL strain. And all of a sudden the 49ers are really thin at running back with no Mostert and no sermon, and also T.J. Watt. We're still waiting on multiple opinions in terms of his torn uh, pectoral muscle. But uh, naturally, let's go back to here. Uh, we'll get to our fantasy standouts here from Seattle. But, uh, you know, I, I think the point has to be made that, Davis, when uh, Hackett took over as the head coach and they acquired Russell Wilson, th that there was just this overwhelming amount of optimism that Denver was going to be just like the Chargers and just like the Chiefs. And, and honestly, in watching that game last night, they looked so much like they did last season, albeit a couple fumbles at the goal line. I get it. It could have been a different result. But it, it seems to me that maybe they just took the head coach, kept a lot of the people around him, and they're, you know, sort of helping make those decisions that are happening. Because, I mean, no disrespect to Vic Fangio, who's a fantastic defensive coordinator, but it looked exactly like that last year, All every game that Denver played, Davis. I mean, I, it's it's tough to tell, you know, what of this is like institutional memory versus what Nathaniel Hackett wants. You know, Justin Otten came with Nathaniel Hackett. He was the tight ends coach for the last three years in Green Bay. This guy, Averro, uh, was a member of the Ram staff. So that, you know, kind of connects him to the Sean McVay uh, tree that we see spreading out throughout the NFL. And, and I'm not sure in terms of like quality control assistance and things like that, who remains the same. But what I will say is that Nathaniel Hackett pretty clearly parlayed playing with these incredible quarterbacks into a job, right? The fact that he was Aaron Rodgers' offensive coordinator made it a lot easier for him to get hired. And I saw nothing from this first game that suggests that he is good enough to have this job. I mean, I, I, I think if I was the Broncos' ownership, I would basically, like if this team is 0-3, or if the offense still looks bad a month from now, like that's it for me. You you can't you cannot invest what they invested in Russell Wilson and then 
treat this guy like he's Geno Smith. I mean, the the Seahawks were more aggressive with play action mm-hmm. and throwing down the field than the Broncos were. And by the way, I, I mean, it's just like they have so many good skill position players too. Like it's not like this is Russell Wilson playing with a bunch of backups. Like they paid Cortland Sutton. They spent a first round pick on Judy. Like this is, it's, it's really troubling. And you can't be losing these non-division games, right? In this division. Like they're going to miss the playoffs if they lose one more of these, because these games against the Raiders, these games against the Chargers and the Chiefs, these are dog fights. Like they cannot afford, you cannot lose as a six point favorite. If you're Nathaniel Hackett and expect to make the playoffs. Yeah, no, really, really tough scene uh, yesterday, I I think, in particular. But again, Monday Night Home Dogs, uh, best bet in the world, over 50% through the years, and again comes through. Uh, Denver could have won that game, should have won that game, but I don't think that the spread was in any danger, really, for the part with Seattle in that one. But fantasy ramifications from that game last night, also injury updates in the NFL. We'll tell you who you should jump on, if there are any players on Seattle, or maybe this was a one-and-done type deal, and then dive in to the games that uh, the Broncos players had too. So stay on the grid with us as Davis and I'll be right back. We'll recap last week's Monday night football game from a fantasy perspective. Also help you out in the waiver wire today too. Don't go away. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College That's football the today. Alabama in winning SEC championships. It's the island of misfit tour. Fantasy sports so, today. You have to understand that. $4 word. gap between them and Kansas City. Pro football them today. Years when this happened to this franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injuries. This is a brutal rash of in injuries. Game, live but you can take all points. access. You can take the money line. And the sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In I'm game go. live. Prime time. I'm a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international. Jason Day and Sergio Garcia. But boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid. Your 24-7 sports wagering network. The morning after. L.A. was a a three-and-a-half-point home favorite against the Las Vegas Raiders, and the Chargers end up covering, winning 24-19. to The second-highest total of the weekend, an over-under pregame that ended at 52-and-a-half, stays well under. And here's the difference in professional football. How many times do we look at it? If you can win the turnover margin by, like, one, you're going to win a good portion of your football games. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. But the one thing that we've always known throughout time, regardless of levels of football, high school, college, and pros, sometimes it comes down to the kicker to decide a game when it really shouldn't. Hard fought, 60 minutes out there on the gridiron, comes down to a missed kick or a made kick. We're going to see this more and more because still, they're human beings and they do make mistakes in massive pressure situations. Only on Sports Grid. Sports Professor Rick Caro inside the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your Sports News Minute analyzing the impact of FIFA and their latest deal. FIFA Collect Plus, they decided to get into the NFT game like everybody else is and creating a solid platform heading into the Men's World Cup in Qatar and the Women's World Cup next year and the year after. The bottom line is that this will provide fans with collectibles but also new facts, analysis, data, And to be part of a club and to be part of scarcity and also be part of branding, especially since FIFA has an extraordinary name recognition across the pond and elsewhere. The bottom line is they were struggling for identity after EA and they decided to change their relationship as far as that kind of deal was concerned. But now that they have a strong deal in this space, especially NFTs, sky's the limit. Great, great. 
So welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. Craig Mitch along with Davis Maddock. It's time now for us to take a look at last night's Monday Night Football game from a fantasy perspective, go through who the standouts were and potentially where we go from here with both teams. Let's start off with Seattle as they pick up the win last night as a six-point underdog. Geno Smith gets the start, and he gets the win. Two touchdowns, 195 passing yards, 14 rushing yards as well. TK Metcalf had seven catches, so he bailed you out with 10 points if you needed that last night. Colby Parkinson, backup tight end, two receptions, 43 yards, and a score. Also, Will Disley, three for 43 and a score. I have a feeling this is going to be a lot what uh, Seattle's box score is probably going to look like, Davis, over the course of the season. Just some anonymous games, probably, for both Lockett and probably for Metcalf. But, uh, look, in the end, it's not pretty, but this is sort of how they're going to do it, is my guess. And they looked pretty aggressive. You know, this was a better version of a passing Seattle team than anyone expected. Geno only threw one incompletion in the first half. Uh, Metcalf, you know, kind of was on pace to maybe have a decent game. But the, the Seattle offense just really stalled out in the second half. I believe they only had four drives in total. Part of that was because they stopped getting first downs. And then part of it was that Denver was just holding on to the ball forever. I mean, these drives... Like they were, they were taking two minutes, you know, for every uh, for every four downs because they were running the clock the entire way. Didn't really make me feel any better about rostering Tyler Lockett or DK Metcalf though, because I think you see that the plan is to kind of just take what the defense gives. Lots of play action. They're going to do a lot of twelve personnel, which means that Parkinson, Disley, and Fant are all going to be playing more than. Uh, D- uh, Dwayne Eskridge, and that makes Lockett and Metcalf's jobs harder because the safeties are going to be able to key in on them pretty easily. The Broncos linebackers were horrible against the tight ends yesterday. The The biggest takeaway I had for fantasy football on the Seattle side, though, was Rashad Penny looks incredible, and he also, I, I believe, had more targets yesterday than he had in any singular game last season, even when he was ripping off all those games with seven yards per carry. So if you were in a league with trading, you know, one of these 12 team home leagues and Mm -hmm. Penny's box score looked okay, but it wasn't like, you know, it's not like he put up 30 points or anything like that. I would maybe be trying to acquire Rashad Penny right now because they were not handing the ball off to Travis Homer at all, who by the way, is clearly, I think the third down back over DJ Dallas and with Kenneth Walker still trying to get back from this hernia injury. I, I do think Penny probably is one of the most undervalued guys at running back right now. Yeah. Uh, Homer playing. I saw on special teams quite a bit yesterday. So it looks like a uh, Penny number one guy for sure. All right, let's go to Denver. If you were hoping for a big game for Russell Wilson, honestly, you got what you asked uh, 340 passing yards, also uh, two rushing yards and one touchdown. Melvin Gordon had 58 yards on the ground, two receptions, 14 yards, and he was kind of the fourth quarterback. Javante Williams had a massive amount of targets and receptions, 11 for 65 in this game, but just 43 rushing yards and fumbles. Jerry Judy, four for 102 and a touchdown. Cortland Sutton, four for 72 and a touchdown. And I think naturally what people are focused on today, Davis, is, and it shouldn't come as any surprise, the Broncos are doing exactly what they did a year ago with uh with melvin gordon and and javante williams they're splitting the the time and and by the way i think a lot of people are going to be very optimistic with javante williams catching as many balls as he should but that is not a recipe for the broncos to win games maybe it ends up being the case this season he's just going to catch a lot of passes out of the backfield but that was just completely out of nowhere for me i mean that was i think one of the most concerning things about this performance was that russ was going to the running backs and going to the tight ends instead of creating Like, you know, what do we think of when we think of Russell Wilson? We think of him hitting these guys, you know, running down the field. And he tried it to Sutton a couple times. The first time he got the uh, defensive pass interference that set up the uh, the Melvin Gordon fumble. Then he tried it again. The defender knew what was coming, got in the way. And it was, it was a wasted down. Even the touchdown pass to Jerry Judy. I mean, that's got to be the ugliest deep touchdown that Russell Wilson has ever thrown. It was underthrown. Judy had to shrug off the defender and then turn on the Jets to get there. And probably the the other really interesting thing is the Russell Wilson offense is just the Russell Wilson offense. There were no throws over the interior of the field. It was all to the boundary for Judy and Sutton, which is exactly what he did in Seattle. You know, think back uh, of all those Russell Wilson seasons in Seattle. Who played out of the slot? Like, you literally can't even name a guy who was primary a slot wide receiver in Seattle because Russ 
I mean, look, he's 5'10". It's hard for him to see that part of the field. He prefers to throw outside. He prefers to throw to the hashes, and that is that is what the Denver offense looked like. Uh, Judy, of course, was phenomenal in that game. I mean, honestly, other than Russell Wilson, you draft Sutton, you feel fine. You draft Judy, you feel good. You draft Javante, you feel good. You draft Melvin Gordon, you feel really good because he's in a he's in a 45-55 with Javante Williams, he's going to get some goal line touches. Uh, now, clearly, I think Javante, if he remains in this, I mean, he had a 26% target share last night. If he can be a 14% target share guy, he can still pay off his early third round tag, even being in this timeshare with Melvin Gordon, because 60 catches is, a, I mean, it's a lot of points, right? That that takes you from being a guy you don't really want, you know, that's like the difference from, from going, you know, Ramondre Stevenson, to Austin Eckler range in terms of like total production. If Javante scores right. a couple long touchdowns, you'll feel good. Yeah. I mean, 20 plus points for a running back without scoring a touchdown. That, that's a pretty big number in fantasy. All right. So uh, naturally well, the other news that we got yesterday were the injuries in fantasy football, which is going to lead us to talking about the waiver wire. For those of you who have it running either tonight or tomorrow morning, we're going to help you out with that as well. But uh, Davis, Dak Prescott, who was initially, thought to be out eight weeks. Jerry Jones, the owner, says it could be just four. So, you know, naturally we'll stay tuned, see what happens. He will not go on IR. Mac Jones for the Patriots, questionable with back spasms, but probably will play. Elijah Mitchell, this is a big one for the 49ers. He is going to be out two months. Chris Godwin probably misses this week. Keenan Allen looks doubtful for uh, the Chargers this week. And T. Higgins is in concussion protocol. He's questionable. I do not expect him to play uh, so Prescott, we talked about a little bit yesterday. Naturally, if they don't sign anyone, it's Cooper Rush there. Let, let's talk about Elijah Mitchell here for a minute because the 49ers, they used Debo Samuel quite a bit running the ball last year. They drafted Trey Sermon, then they let him go. Moster, who they had last year, they let him go too. And I'm sure we'll get into it on the waiver wire, but Mitchell had a clear path to a lot of rushes this season. And now it's back to Jeff Wilson Jr. It feels like for a, what, third year in a row? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think Jeff Wilson Jr. will be the guy who gets the first carry for the 49ers this week. But uh, sort of interesting that Jordan Mason, the sixth-round pick, was active over Tyrion Davis-Price, but did not see the field on offense. Because if you think back to last season, so Trey Sermon isn't active, Eli Mitchell is active. Mitchell came in the game and was getting touches right away. Uh, now remember, also Jeff Wilson Jr. was injured back then. I think that Mason was largely active for special teams, and that's why he made the team over Trey Sermon. And Tyrion Davis-Price does not play special teams, but they kept him over Trey Sermon. I, my guess would be Tyrion Davis-Price is actually going to be ahead of Jordan Mason in terms of receiving the touches next week. So he would probably be the guy I would prefer to add in most uh, in most of my, my fantasy leagues. Uh, your, your Dallas Cowboys, right? Dak Prescott injured. I'm not starting anyone. Zeke. Hmm. Zeke is really the only guy. I, I don't even want to start C.D. Lamb next week. I mean, uh, Cooper Rush is not a good quarterback. I mean, just one of, the, one of the worst guys you're going to see on an NFL roster. And then, honestly, don't really see an ad for the Buccaneers with Chris Godwin out. I mean, you know, Scotty Miller, Jalen Darden, Cameron. I don't think I really want to add or start any of those guys, but it does. It is definitely good for Julio and for Mike Evans. You don't think uh, T. Higgins is going to play, right? If you have him, you better make alternate plans tomorrow. No, I mean, and the T. I would, I would definitely make alternate plans, and I would say Hayden Hurst uh, is is probably the guy you want to add or start there. He saw seven targets with T. Higgins out. All right, so there you go. Uh, we're going to talk about that coming up next. It's time for our fantasy football waiver wire here on this Tuesday. We're going to run through some players that you can pick up on the waiver wire. Either uh, maybe you're running today or even tomorrow. In, uh, or maybe even Thursday for fantasy football. So we'll handle that for you coming up next. We also have fantasy reality and, of course, the Sports Grid 60. So stay on the grid with us as we continue on here on the Tuesday on FSD. And we'll be back right after these messages. Don't go away. Break, break. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They play 
less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Aaron Rodgers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. sports the today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast to coast. That's where they win cups. They win Stanley Cups over there. Give me the Game pass. time decisions. Kind of bizarre when you consider it. Like the, everybody is out for the Warriors. In game, live, I all like access. Mandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game, oh, live, man. prime oh, time. The PGA champion. In yes. game, live, overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The morning after. A runaway win. A 21 and a half point favorite DRS. That's what Alabama was by the time we got to kick on Saturday afternoon in Austin. What stood out to you most about that game, DRS, between the Tide and the Longhorns? Texas should have won that football game, but that shows me a lot meaning. Sarkeesian has the ear of this football team. They weren't just going to take it on the chin. They didn't, even though they lost their star quarterback. I like what I saw from Texas. I did. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. If you would have told me the Texans scored 20 points through three quarters... If you would have told me the Colts scored 14 points in the fourth quarter, if you would have told me we got to overtime, I would have anticipated cashing some tickets. 20 to 20, this game finished. Matt Ryan stinks. He's overrated. This show told you that. Nobody else. Everybody, oh, Matt Ryan's going to change the whole identity of the Colts. No, he doesn't. Only on Sports Grid. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Pharrell, coast to coast. The one that I'm worried about is Harris. Because if they lose him, honestly, their offense is bad enough. Uh, you know, he was a 1,200-yard guy last year. They can't afford to lose Harris. That was a huge win. Minka was the defensive player of the week in the NFL with the pick six, Izzy, and the blocks extra point at the end of the game. Yeah, now Harris is more of an ankle than a foot injury, and they don't have good depth at running back. The kid Jalen Warren, the undrafted free agent. The Sports Grid Network. Great, great. All right, welcome back, Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. It's time to talk some waiver wire in fantasy football, Davis. And naturally, for some people, this is going to be a pickup week that's very important. Usually the early weeks are because, again, you get this player and you have him for the rest of the season. Now, naturally, there were a few injuries at the running back position that have changed the landscape a little bit about what we're talking about here. So I'd like to kind of go through them with you and see who you would invest in this week, who you would pick up potentially, maybe spend some fab budget on. Uh, let's let's take a look here. Uh, Jeff Wilson Jr. will get the start for San Francisco, obviously, because they have no one else. Jamal Williams was the red zone guy for Detroit. He could be on the waiver wire in some leagues. You'll have to tell us who Jalen Warren is on Pittsburgh in case Najee Harris can't go this week. And actually, if Brian Robinson did not get drafted, maybe he's sitting out there on the waiver wire. Yeah, I mean, pretty much always in week one. One of these guys is going to end up being a guy you needed to have. You know, Eli Mitchell was that guy last season, James Robinson, two years ago. And, you know, a great little axiom to remember when you use your fab dollars is they are worth less to your team every single week because the amount of games that they can impact are lower. So if you acquire a great guy with your free agency acquisition budget this week, you're going to be able to start him for the next 16 weeks, right? If you grab a guy in week eight, well, he's probably going to only be able to impact eight games. So it's pretty important, I think, in general to to consider that when you are making your bids in week one. I feel pretty good about Jeff Wilson Jr. I mean, he's not going to project super well, probably project for 10, 11 points in this next game, but he could always get some of those high-value touches in the past. We've seen him be the 49ers goal line back 
Uh, Jamal Williams, more of a contingent value guy. You know, not expecting to be able to start him most weeks for the Detroit Lions, but he is going to get some goal line work, but clearly would have a huge role were DeAndre Swift to miss any time. Jalen Warren is the clear handcuff running back to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Benny Snell did not play a snap after Najee left with that foot injury against the Bengals. Um, now, obviously, that role is not great. The Steelers' offense doesn't look very good. Didn't look like they were going to throw it to the running backs as much as they had in years past. But definitely, I think a high, I mean, you know, really no different than adding a, a Tony Pollard, Alexander Madison type. He is the clear, clear handcuff. Needs to be owned in all. 12 team leagues. And then we have Brian Robinson Jr. here, who, according to reports, apparently got shot in the preseason and is expected to be back with the team by week five. Uh, just really incredible. I mean, great story for him. Uh, you know, very obviously happy to see that his, you know, career is not ended or anything by that. A couple other quick names to mention here at running back. Jordan Mason was the running back who was active last week for the 49ers. Tyrion Davis Price also, I think you can spend a couple bucks on. He seems uh, interesting as well. Rex Burkhead out snapped Damian Pierce 70 to 30, got more carries. Got more targets. I mean, he is a, a starting running back who is on the waiver wire in some of your leagues. You need to make sure to snap him up. Dontrell Hilliard, the clear passing down back for the Tennessee Titans. And then Kenyon Drake was just the starting running back for the Baltimore Ravens. Played 60% of the snaps. Not a super useful role because Lamar doesn't throw to the running backs, but probably should not be out there in 12-team leagues. Okay, fair enough. Those are some running backs you could take a look at this week. Now let's talk about some wide receivers. Jarvis Landry coming off a really strong first game with the Saints. If Keenan Allen is out, Josh Palmer gets a chance with the Chargers. That's a Thursday game, by the way, so I have to make that move quick. Jahan Dotson, how about this for Washington? He's a favorite to win Rookie of the Year. Who had that one at the beginning of the season? And then DJ Shark goes from Jacksonville to Detroit, seeing a lot of action with the Lions. Yeah, I mean, John Dotson would definitely be the guy I would want the most from this list. First round rookie wide receiver, played right away. You know, I mean, that's really what we look for with these guys is who can get on the field right away, who has earned the trust of the coaching staff and of the quarterback. Josh Palmer, a phenomenal add as well. Probably the best thing about Palmer is that he is capable of filling in both for Keenan Allen in the slot and Mike Williams on the perimeter. If either of them were to miss time, I don't think Keenan Allen is going to be back in time to play the Chiefs on Thursday night. I would imagine Palmer will be ranked as a top 36 wide receiver next week, which means that he is a clear fantasy start. Jarvis Landry read the New or uh, led the New Orleans Saints in routes run, targets. Uh, and, and by the way, Jameis, I mean, look, they, they kind of did what we thought they might do. You know, it's kind of the middle between – it wasn't Tampa Bay, Jameis. You know, they didn't throw uh, 57 times in this game. But it definitely was a more aggressive version of the Saints offense than it was last season. Like, last season, Jameis would have gotten the biggest talking to from Sean Payton of his life had he thrown – that boundary ball to Michael Thomas that he ended up winning, but he threw a boundary ball to Michael Thomas and, you know, double coverage and just very risky. So I, I like the Jameis uh, specifically for Alave, for Landry, for Michael Thomas, that they are letting him, you know, kind of just be, be Jameis Winston. And then DJ Shark, I mean, obviously the deep ball guy in Detroit, not the guy you want. You you definitely, um, you want him on Ross St. Brown, who... Right. I mean, Amon Ross St. Brown literally might be a first-round pick next season. He's got seven straight games with 30% of the team's targets or more, uh, eight straight games with a red zone target, and six straight games with a touchdown going back to last season. Like, if you can get Amon Ross St. Brown in your league right now, do it. But the fact that Amon Ross St. Brown is so great means that DJ Shark down the field, single coverage, I mean, he's really good in that scenario. So I think he is needs to be owned in all 12-team leagues as well. All right, now let's go over to tight end. Now, Davis, this week a lot of fantasy players are going to have itchy fingers wanting to cut their own tight end because of last week's wasteland. Uh, Gerald Everett, uh, probably you know not drafted in some leagues, and again, with no Keenan Allen, he will suit up this week against Kansas City for the Chargers. Robert Tunyon on Green Bay, none of their receivers look good. Hayden Hurst maybe gets an extra look in Cincinnati with no T. Higgins. And then O.J. Howard, my gosh, what a debut he had for Houston. And, and who knows, Davis, maybe O.J. Howard has 10 touchdowns, or maybe that was his best game of the season. I'm just not sure. I think that was probably his best game of the season. He played six snaps in this game for the Houston Texans. He ran three routes, and he caught touchdowns on 
two of those routes, Brevin Jordan, uh, far and away led the team in snaps and routes at the tight end position. But this is how bad the tight end position is. Um, only 12 guys scored in the double digits in PPR and guys who scored touchdowns at the tight end position. Kelsey scored one. OJ Howard scored two. Taysom Hill scored a rushing touchdown. Gerald Everett scored a receiving touchdown. And then the other guys who scored touchdowns played last night. Will Disley and Colby Parkinson, who are owned and should not be, you know, owned in 0% of leagues and should not be picked up in any leagues. It is just a, a desperately brutal position. Uh, Gerald Everett, the clear top guy for me here. I, I think, I mean, if I was going to redo my rankings today, I think I would have him as a top 10 fantasy football tight end. You know, there was no uh, Donald Parham in there. The team didn't re-sign Jared Cook. Like, Gerald Everett is just going to play 70% of the snaps for one of the best passing offenses in football. And then honestly, I, I would, if I could go back and do it again, I'd be pretty high on Hayden Hurst because Drew Sample was not in there running any routes. And, you know, you kind of would think like, oh, T Higgins is going out. It's going to be a huge Tyler Boyd game. Wasn't a huge Tyler Boyd game. Hayden Hurst ran more routes and ended up earning more targets after T Higgins went out of the game. So I, I think that's the direction you need to go. But the, the biggest ad at the tight end position, it's got to be Taysom Hill. Um, if Taysom Hill is out there in your league and he is eligible at tight end, he, now he only played 16 snaps, but he got the ball on six of those snaps, which is basically, if you want to rewind your brain, to 2019, Taysom scored seven touchdowns that year, played less than 200 snaps, but every time that team got in the red zone, Taysom came out. We saw some Taysom right. Cat. We saw Jameis hand him the ball. You, you want Taysom in your fantasy league. Yeah, for sure. And, and I know a lot of people are looking to cut different tight ends. You know, Isaiah Likely was, was a hot name. We talked about Davis a couple of weeks ago. I'm seeing everybody wants to just let go of him this week. I don't know if that's the right call. He played a lot uh, last week for the Baltimore Ravens. Did we miss uh, anyone else? Is there like a defensive matchup this week or or some other player that we haven't discussed? Maybe a quarterback that's on the back end. Would, would you add Geno Smith well, to a super fan? Mariota. Mariota would be the guy you want. Ran 12 times, 72 yards, and a rushing touchdown. I, for example, I have Aaron Rodgers in a league. I'm dropping him this week for Mariota. I have, I don't really have any faith in the Packers figuring it out. Now, maybe I'll add Aaron Rodgers back again, but I'm not starting mm -hmm. him this week. I mean, they just look like they gave up. Like, don't, don't really want that offense. Um, da obviously, you know, if you had Dak Prescott, you're dropping him. That would be that would be an example. Like I think Mariota, as long as he's healthy, is going to project for like 17 to 19 points on a given week, which is like a pretty good range, mm -hmm. just because he's going to add four or five points with his legs every week. Yeah, no, definitely. So, so those are some good waiver wire pickups, obviously for this week. And by the way, if you want more fantasy football help, both on the daily side and season long side, just head on over to DailyRoto.com. And all the content this year is completely free. Davis and his team can help you out and help you win fantasy football leagues this year. No question about that. And uh, Davis, I know tomorrow we'll dive more into the DFS league. When, when does the pricing come out these days? For, is, are, is it out already? On I think Tuesday, right? Isn't oh, that when it comes out on FanDuel and DraftKings? It's out, buddy. We got we got the, oh, the we got the prices for uh, we have the prices for next Sunday's slate. Normally, they try to hold off for the showdown slates because they don't want you know a, a two hundred dollar wide receiver being a starter right. or something like that. Yeah, right. All right, makes sense. Okay, coming up next, it's time for some fantasy or reality. We'll dive into a number of topics, including, of course, Monday Night Football, also the Emmys, and then the epic showdown today for Mike Trout, if he's in the lineup, to try and match the Major League Baseball record for consecutive home runs hit. An incredible record as Trout has had uh, an, an unbelievable season. 35 home runs played in less than 100 games. Crazy season for Trout. Uh, he and Otani, can they ever you know, get an MVP together and, and maybe win a championship? Who knows? All right, so coming up next, Fantasy or Reality, Sports Grid 60. So stay on the grid for that reminder. I'm back with you at 2 o'clock Eastern for another edition of Newswire. So those of you dipping for lunch, come back at 2 o'clock Eastern. We'll talk about sports wagering then. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Sports Grid. 
your 24-7 sports wagering network. They played last game. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less. Rogers and the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the Today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell coast to coast. That's where they win cups. They win Stanley Cups over there. Give me the Game penalty. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider it. Like so everybody is out for the Warriors. In game, live, I all like access. Vandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take a corner. In half. game, oh, live, man. prime oh, yeah, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game, live, overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The morning after. A runaway win. A 21 and a half point favorite DRS. That's what Alabama was by the time we got to kick on Saturday afternoon in Austin. What stood out to you most about that game, DRS, between the Tide and the Longhorns? Texas should have won that football game, but that shows me a lot meaning. Sarkeesian has the ear of this football team. They weren't just going to take it on the chin. They didn't, even though they lost their star quarterback. I like what I saw from Texas. I did. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. If you would have told me that Texans scored 20 points through three quarters... If you would have told me the Colts scored 14 points in the fourth quarter, if you would have told me we got to overtime, I would have anticipated cashing some tickets. 20-20 to this game finished. Matt Ryan stinks. He's overrated. This show told you that. Nobody else. Everybody else. Matt Ryan's going to change the whole identity of the Colts. No, he doesn't. Only on SportsGrid. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Pharrell, coast to coast. The one that I'm worried about is Harris. Because if they lose him, honestly, their offense is bad enough. Uh, you know, he was a 1,200-yard guy last year. They can't afford to lose Harris. That was a huge win. Minka was the defensive player of the week in the NFL with the pick six, Izzy, and the blocks extra point at the end of the game. Yeah, now Harris is more of an ankle than a foot injury, and they don't have good depth at running back. The kid Jalen Warren, the undrafted creation. The Sports Grid Network. Great, great. Welcome back to Fantasy Sports today. For those of you on social media, you should be following us on Twitter. That's at SportsGrid and at SportsGrid TV for the latest news, notes, information, picks against the spread, and all of our fun content, including our Saturday morning and Sunday morning shows. And naturally, we're waiting on the press conference this morning, Davis, for uh, for you know both the Denver Broncos and Seattle Seahawks. But after the game last night, Russell Wilson did tell the media that he believes that it was the right decision to kick that field goal uh, or attempt a field goal of 64 yards last night. Loser mentality, absolute loser mentality. And I know that Russ, like, you know, he, he probably like in general, he seems like a guy who doesn't like to ruffle the feathers. I mean, he was clearly unhappy in Seattle with the way they, they, I mean, look, let's, let's go all the way back to throwing the interception at the goal line. And then, you know, drafting DK Metcalf and not like, you know, there, there was a lot of acrimony between him and Pete Carroll, but, but media facing, he always kept it pretty cool, right? There was never, you never got him at the press conferences trashing the coach. So I think that's kind of the way he rolls. But I was, what, what I was imagining last night when that happened is like, if Andy Reid did that to Patrick Mahomes, like the universe would just implode. Like it would just never happen. You're never, you would never look or, or, or Brandon Staley and Justin Herbert, right? Never, never in a million years are they taking the ball out of the hands of their quarterback with five yards to go, right? I mean, Andy Reid dialed up a, a, a play with Chad Henney in the same circumstances in, in a conference championship game with Chad Henney. Like this is, it's, it's inexcusable. There, there is not an excuse that Hackett can make. 
Yeah. And uh, and people were saying here in, in my neck of the woods, that, you know, Mike McDaniel with them up three touchdowns. Fourth and seven. Seven had two at throwing the ball. I, I don't think it applies just to Mahomes. I mean, any Hall of Fame quarterback with five yards to go, I don't care who it is. Eli Manning, Brett Favre, Kurt Same. Warner. It's, like, it's just, uh, yeah, bizarre. All right. Uh, time for some fantasy or reality. All right, Davis, big night for Mike Trout tonight and the Los Angeles Angels in a wasted lost season with two superstars doing unbelievable things. Mike Trout can add another one to his resume. And this is, Davis, this is really hard to do. I mean, think about this, playing seven games in a row and hitting a home run in all of them. Uh, You know, Ken Griffey Jr. did this. Don Mattingly did this. Dale Long was the first one to do this to reach eight games and so that would tie the major league baseball record if he does it tonight davis so that's where we will begin here on fantasy reality davis mike trout will be the mate will tie the major league baseball consecutive home runs hit record tonight you know what i am just gonna go ahead and say reality because it's more fun if it's true the angels are playing against the cleveland guardians Cody Morris, who is age 25, was a seventh round pick in 2018, is the guy who is pitching. Uh, He was a extremely high K rate guy in the minors, but also walked a ton of guys uh, in six starts in the minor leagues. He gave up over a home run per nine innings. I'm just going to say it happens. Trout, he's all juiced up. He knows exactly what he needs to do. What is, I mean, what are the Angels even playing this season for? And like, it's, 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 you know, it's like, the, the, the stats you can pull out from the Los Angeles Angels, like, this is the first time in history these two teammates have done this. It's the first time a guy has pitched seven shutout innings with 13 strikeouts and hit a home run since Tungsten Armo Doyle in 1913, and the Angels lose 8-4. to four. Like, it's just, they, they, the team just only exists to glorify these two guys. I, I say we do it. I say, I say Trout does get it done tonight. Yeah, I, I don't know a lot about Cody Morris, i got to be honest with you, but Cleveland has had some season with all these anonymous players and maybe winning the American League Central with a, what, $30 billion payroll? I mean, it's just bananas. But uh, All right, so eight games. No one's ever done nine. I definitely want to be on this show tomorrow doing this question again, Davis, so I'm going to go with you. I'm going to ride this one tonight. I'm going to say that he does it. He matches Griffey. He matches Don Mattingly. I'll tell you this. When Don Mattingly did this, Davis – Imagine uh, Major League Baseball at a time where you were not you were not watching all the games, and you could basically just watch the Cubs, or the Braves, or the Yankees. Those were the only three teams, Davis, on television. There were no other games, but the Yankees were on every night when Don Mattingly was mm-hmm. riding the streak. You could actually watch this. So the magnitude of that at the time, because there was no other alternative, it wasn't like you could just tune into another game. It was out of this world. Uh, I, I, I think he'll do it. I do. I think he'll hit eight and then we're going to have a real conversation because I mean, to, to think that this guy can do nine straight games of a home run is out of this world. So I'll go with you reality. I'll ride this wave uh, tonight. All right. Last night, Monday night football, the debut of Joe Buck and Troy Aikman on Monday night football. A lot of folks talking about that last night on social media for sure. And then of course you have the alternate cast, which is the Manning cast, which Uh, Features Peyton Manning and Eli Manning. So we will start off here by asking this question, fantasy or reality. You watched Peyton and Eli instead of Joe and Troy. You know what? I I think this might be an indication, Craig, that I am am slowly becoming a boomer because I watched Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. I I, I put it on on my phone. I put my headphones in. Uh, I was kind of, you know, doing a little bit of stuff around the house, uh, hanging out with the dogs a little bit in the first half. And I don't know, there's just something about Joe Buck's voice that makes me think of football, right? Or at least that makes me think of like fall sports, right? So Joe Buck, you know, calls uh, call these games on Fox forever, calls a bunch of the postseason games. Like Joe Buck's voice to me just says I should be watching sports on my couch 
in the fall. And the Manning cast is like good. Like when I when I uh, I saw one of the clips of it of like of uh, Peyton begging Nathaniel Hackett to call a timeout and go for it when he ended up kicking right. the field goal. Like I mean, it's 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 not an indication that it's not good. I I will say though, I don't love the constant guest changing like I would I I think I would prefer a format where either it's one guest a week and they bring a third guy in the booth with them and then that third guy just stays the entire time versus like a rotating cast of characters but I I I gotta say fantasy I did watch Joe and Troy because I'm a boomer now yeah so for me unfortunately so I did watch some of the game but I was sort of in and out of the game last night Things happen in life. My son yesterday came home from school, not feeling good, go to the doctor, has a cold, you know, the whole thing. And you know what that means for me, Davis. It means, like, that's it. Like, <laughs> that is the focus last night. Dad, will you play MLB The Show with me? And Monday Night Game is on. I'm like, all right, sure. I lost. Uh, but I did watch Joe and Troy. That was what I watched. I watched the end of the game, too. I watched the full fourth quarter and the end of the game, too. But I was sort of in and out of that game last night and uh, lacking sleep today, for sure. So I will say uh, fantasy. I did not watch Peyton and Eli at all last night. No indictment on them whatsoever. It just was what I watched last night happened to be on, on the television. All right, let's let's uh, let's cap off the Emmys. Now, I am aware of the Emmys happening last night, too, only because I was aware a better call Saul not winning anything. I was very disappointed in seeing that, but I did not watch it. Based on that, I don't know that this will be an easy question for me to answer. Maybe, Davis, you'll have better luck. Fantasy or reality, you know what show Lizzo won an Emmy for. Is this fantasy or reality? Yeah, this is uh, this is a fantasy. I mean, I think we, we've kind of briefly touched on this before on the show. Just not an award show guy. You know, I, I if, if I have a choice between... Uh, you know, a, a, I mean, definitely a Monday night football game and an award show, but even like rewatching uh, a James Bond movie for the sixth time or an award show, I'm going rewatching the James Bond movie, right? You know, No Time to Die is on cable. I'm watching No Time to Die. And also, again, this is another part of growing old is like, I'm not engaging with that much new media. Like in terms of like new shows, I, I'm not... I, I'm not doing a ton of that, not listening to a ton of new music. I did see that White Lotus, which I thought was great, one of those uh, HBO uh, originals. I did see that they cleaned up at the Emmys. Uh, good for them. And uh, my timeline seemed very happy that Abbott Elementary, again, a show I have not watched, won yeah. a ton of Emmys. And it, so, you know, obviously it's about a school. And apparently the producers, you know, because there's financial rewards for winning Emmys and contract bonuses and things. Apparently the producers and actors of the show are donating all of those proceeds to, uh, you know, elementary schools, which is, is pretty cool, but no, no, I, I did, I did not even know Lizzo had entered into the foray of acting at this point. Yeah, no, me either. Uh, I got fantasy. So what was it for Brad? I don't even know that we got the answers to this. Uh, I had no idea. Okay, Big there Girls Best Competition Show, says Brett. I had no idea that that even existed, but congratulations to Lizzo for sure for winning that, no doubt. But can we just focus here on Better Call Saul not winning anything, Davis? I mean, what in the world? This is like one of the, the best shows of the last few years on television. I mean, some people feel it's like the best show. I don't get it. I don't understand. I mean, what is this? Is this like a popularity contest? How do the Emmys even work? I mean, I, I it also feels like that show is like set up to win a lot of Emmys, you know, like yeah. uh, it feels like the gal who plays uh, Kim Wexler, like feels yeah. like she was just like, how does that girl not win an Emmy? Um, you know, how does, how does uh, Mr. Uh, why, why am I drawing a blank on his name? So why am I drawing a blank on Saul's name in real life? His brother is a writer on the Simpsons. What, what is his name? Bob, Bob Odenkirk. Yeah. So Bob Odenkirk is like one of the greatest entertainers of our era uh, his bro- I mean, his brother is a writer for The Simpsons. They've made all kinds of like niche comedy. I mean, he is the best. I mean, Bob Odenkirk would be like one of the ten best people in entertainment alive today. So it does, it does feel a little bit, it does feel a little bit silly. It did, um, and I don't think any of the the Star Wars shows won any of, uh, no. you know, won any of these awards either. Which is, you know, again, feels like that is kind of made to be prestige TV. It'll be very interesting to see next year what the academy decides to do with uh this lord of the Rings show which is uh the most True. expensive television show ever produced i wonder this gal uh morford clark who plays the, the the primary protagonist she is like 
unbelievable to me. So I wonder, I wonder if she ends up winning any awards. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing there for sure. So look, we will see. I, I think that's kind of the dynamic though, is like, we don't like succession is, is a show. I know Davis that won a lot yesterday. Uh, and, and, and again, I hear it's a great show. I just have not watched it. So I mean, maybe this gives me some more things to watch when when i have a chance to stream i have not even gotten through this cobra kai though i i mean we started it and then just things got in the way of our days and i haven't finished that as well and then football started davis you know how that is right like that was my saturday thing i'm like i can't watch it now the gators are on the gators lost last week Oof. oh i know we haven't we haven't covered that yet on the show craig i was very disappointed i was extremely you extremely disappointed yeah. yeah well you yeah, know i i placed that i placed the the wager to Anthony Richardson to win the Heisman and it's just immediately dead you know because Bryce Young <laughs> makes that play against Texas where Bryce yeah. Young dodges out of the way of that defensive end and like well that's it no one else is winning the Heisman Bryce Young's just gonna win it yeah no Richardson did not look right in that game against Kentucky so well we'll see not the not the last bet Davis you'll tear up before the end of the season that's for sure all right coming up true. next it's time for us to hit on the sports grid 60 and then we'll turn it over to Kevin and Donnie. They have the early line coming up. I'll be back with you at 2 o'clock Eastern for another edition of Newswire. And over the next couple of days, we'll get you ready for week two of the fantasy football season. We do have our first ever Amazon Prime exclusive game coming this Thursday night with Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreit. So we'll preview the Chiefs and Chargers a little tomorrow and then dive in deep on Thursday. These days in the NFL, you basically get 24 hours off, like starting now through Wednesday. And then we got to dive right back in so we'll do that on the show tomorrow so stay on the grid we'll be back to wrap it up next Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. In the landscape of college sports, some things remain the same. College the football today. Alabama and winning SEC champions. It's the Island of Misfit Tour. Fantasy sports so today. You have to understand that. $4 word. gap between them and Kansas City. Pro football now them today. Years when this happened to this franchise, they are comical. Now, I'm not making light of the injury. This is a brutal rash. In-game live all access. You can take the money line. And the sports book, if you shop around, you can get it at 133. But um, that's my best bet on the night, Joe. So that's the one I'm going big. In-game live. Prime time. I'm going a bit nostalgic. I'm going with an international. Jason Zay and Sergio Garcia. Well, boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination? Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Pharrell, coast to coast. There's a saying around coaches who run the National Football League when it comes to backup quarterbacks. The longer they play, the more they look like backups. Two, three, maybe four games you get away with it. But the longer they play, the more they look like backups. And the funny thing with the Cowboys, Pharrell, is they don't even have another quarterback on the roster. Dak will go into injured reserve. And then Cooper Rush will be the starter. And they're going to have to add at least one more quarterback, if not another. But th this crushes them. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. All right, Justin Jefferson broke his uh, career record for receiving yards. He had over 150 for the Vikings at the half. This is why we tell you, just draft wide receivers earlier and figure it out at running back later. You know, take Jamal Williams and Cordero Patterson, because guess what? Look at look at all these names here at, at the top of wide receiver. Justin Jefferson, first round pick. Cooper Cup, first round pick. Devontae Adams, first round pick. Jamar Chase, first round pick. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. The Giants beat the Titans 21 to 20 with a late decision to go for two. Three and O oh for the other three teams here in the NFC East. My question to you, who had the most impressive 
week one victory of this bunch. Thoroughly impressed by the New York Giants. And going down double digits at the half, it looked like one of those games, Kevin, where we said to ourselves, man, Daniel Jones might not even, and I joked before the season, like he might get pulled like Only two. on Sports Grid. Welcome back to Fantasy Sports Today here on Sports Grid. As a reminder, right back here, 2 o'clock Eastern, for another edition of Newswire. But Davis's day here on Sports Grid, I believe, is coming to an end. So let's let him do it. Here's today's Sports Grid 60. You know what? I'm just going to use this time to dunk on Nathaniel Hackett a little bit more. More reasons why this decision to kick a 64-yard field goal was worse. Historically, is one uh, histor- historically Seattle one of the worst places to kick in the NFL? No kicker has ever made a field goal of 57 yards or longer at their stadium uh, since it opened in 2002. Kickers are 0 for 6 at distances over 56 yards. For reference, last season. Teams to go for it on exactly fourth and five converted it 49% of the time, 22 attempts out of 45. I would imagine if you adjust that for having, you know, a Hall of Fame quarterback, Russell Wilson, with Jerry Judy, Corlin Sutton, Javante. Well, it felt like Javante could get five yards on a reception literally that entire game. It felt like it just was, there was a, a freeway for him to run down. Yeah, I will end the show today with the chase for eight home runs with Mike Trout. I think that this is super exciting. Gives us all something on a Tuesday night to watch and pay attention to. Uh, this has happened, a, you know, a couple of years. Uh, you know, Joey Votto, I think, hit seven. He did not go to eight. I remember asking Don Mattingly about just how difficult it is to do that every single day. Uh, he downplayed it, but essentially saying that it's one of the hardest things that you can do in baseball. It's not hard to get locked in for a day or two, but it is really hard to get locked in for over a week. And essentially, no one's really playing games every single day over the course of the week. They get a day off or two. So good luck to Mike Trout tonight. We'll keep an eye on it. We'll be right back here to talk about it tomorrow. Maybe Albert Pujols hits number 698 as well. Fun ending to the season, that's for sure. That'll do it for our show today. Thanks to our friends at LTN, our great graphics department for sure, our producer Brett Levy for my co-host Davis Maddock. I'm Craig Mish. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Take a deep breath. No football tonight, but baseball is back this evening. We'll see you tomorrow at 2 o'clock Eastern. Great, great.